And now we have uh, 12 uh, minutes uh, for uh, some discussion. I think that uh, Monsieur Cabestan is the premier que j'ai vu. I have three French spe potential uh, speakers, in the, which, which shows that uh, uh, France is indeed an Indo-Pacific power. <laughs> Oui, micro. Yes, it's on. Okay, well, th th thank you for the conference, uh, to the conference to ha for having put together this panel in the Indo-Pacific. Um, actually, um, uh, your remark, uh, Mr. Montbria, you were pretty uh, uh, sensible on the idea that it's uh, maybe an uncertain concept. Uh, but living in, in the Indo-Pacific myself, uh, I, I tend to agree with Mr. Yim, who was uh, the, the, the clearest speaker on this uh, very concept of Indo-Pacific, supporting the view that actually uh, its aim is uh, to balance China's rising power. So I would like to ask the three other speakers, do you agree with Mr. Yim that the Indo-Pacific concept is aimed at balancing China in your region? Um, so uh, and I have another question which is more specific. To related to India and Mr. Naraya, you haven't talked upon the very much about the relationship with China along the border. Do you think that the, your your relation with China will, can go back to normal uh, if the border issue is not solved, or how do you see the way forward regarding the LAC and the the border dispute with China? Do you think your relationship can stabilize with China in the coming years or not? Thank you. Thank you very much. So what I will do, I will, I will take three questions. And uh, so I, I want not only to have French speakers, so I, I don't see you, uh, if, but I, I see your hand. So if you can identify yourself, I cannot see you because of the light. Okay, thank you. I'm by you from Indonesia. Uh, I think the, the I would like to support Douglas approach on the historical perspective of uh, the Indo-Pacific cooperations. There is APEC, there is uh, RCEP, there is Indo-Pacific and so forth. So this is not the first uh, initiative and certainly will be not the last of maybe in the next years or years to come another uh, uh, initiative. But for Indonesia at least, this is not a question about security, it's a question more. In security it means uh, military, no. But in terms of economics, yes. And we cannot choose between China and, and, and US. That both are our biggest uh, trading partners. And not mentioning that within the Indonesia uh, uh, society, there is also the dimension of socio-cultural. We are linked to uh, almost all of the countries in Asia, as well as US, we are very close uh, one to another. And I think this initiative, uh, we welcome it. But we, I think, put um, uh, yesterday as a very good uh, term on it, the multi-alignment approach. And I think many uh, Asian countries will see that, at least in ASEAN, uh, I'm, I'm certain uh, that most of them will have that kind of approach. I would like to, to hear probably from our colleague in India and, and, and Japan how to, to see this. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Michel uh, Fouché, uh, Hervé Mariton. Yeah, just Michel a Fouché. remark. Uh, as far as I know, <clears throat> the, the mental map, because it's a map, it's about space. Uh, was first uh, used by Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in India in an address in 2007 in the Indian Parliament with the idea of, the, I quote, the confluence of the two seas. Uh, in your view, this mental map was referring to which kind of concept you mentioned with uh, Nice reference to the French aesthetics. Thank you for that. <laughs> Hervé, Hervé Mariton. Yes, uh, Thierry was joking about uh, French uh, putting questions just now, and my question is actually to Thierry and others. When France uh, underlines in its uh, strategic review its Indo-Pacific dimension, do you understand this as an anecdote or something more serious? <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, we can uh, take. Uh, so please, re re as concise as possible for the for the for, for, for the answers. So, so to have a chance to have another round of questions. So who wants to shoot first? First, perhaps uh, India first. <coughs> By the way, as a mathematician, which uh, I claim still claim to be. The, I am very much embarrassed by the concept of multi-alignment, <coughs> which means nothing. Because uh, there is a famous verse in a French uh, poem which says, tout, aimer tout le monde, c'est aimer personne. No, that is, to love everyone is to love no one. So, Mr. Narayanan. Okay, um, I think rather than addressing the individual questions that were raised, I'll just give you, I think because the major conflict in uh, Asia today is between China and India. And what I would like to stress is that the conflict within India and China is not so much about territory or the seas, but I think it's a civilizational conflict. And China and India, at no time in the past or in the future have been friends and will remain friends because they are perennial opponents of two different philosophies. So on, let's start the, the, on the territorial point. If I did not specify the, the, or make a reference to the border conflict between India and China because it is one of long standing. It has several different facets. Uh, it's a long border. The problem for India has been, civilizationally, Indians are not map makers. Uh, all our uh, uh, traditions, all the writings are all oral rather than written. The Chinese are great at writing. I was for six, and six years or so, the special representative for border talks between India and China. Dai Bingo was my counterpart. And I could explain almost whether, where a tree or a, or a river or a watershed took away, but he would say, please produce a map. And there I used to be stymied on, on that point. So there, we have an undemarcated border and there are border skirmishes. And the way China operates is that whenever it thinks that India is going to, closer to the United States or closer to the anti-China group, they will rake up one of these issues, Galwan Valley, for instance. I, I've trekked in the Galwan Valley, so I know what I'm talking about. It's, in a sense, to, to begin with, it's very difficult to demarcate which is the border and which is the border. It's, it's an unfortunate instance where actually people died. But normally, there, <clears throat> there are several skirmishes of the state place taking place on the, on the border because the forces which are there, they try to say that, you know, they put up mounds of stones, etc., and somebody removes it, and that becomes an incident, etc. So, vis-a-vis vis -vis the border skirmishes, I, while the Galwan Valley is, is a most unfortunate event, I, I think there are issues on, on both sides as to where the border really lies. I know that in 1960, when Lai came to India, the uh, Lai had made an offer saying, you give us most, most areas of succession and you can have the entire what was then the Northeast Frontier Agency. India was not willing to accept it. Then <clears throat> this, it keeps going up and down. Deng Xiaoping made the same thing in 1988 when Rajiv Gandhi went to, to uh, China. So the border is a different issue. I mean, there will always be a, a kind of thing. Today, China is very much interested in the North, what we call Arunachal Pradesh, the Northeast Frontier because the Brahmaputra River has become important. They are trying to dam the Brahmaputra. They have dammed the Brahmaputra River, but the biggest dam is yet to come up. And the bend, bend in the India means that the reservoir falls within India. And so that becomes an important issue. But on the other, the structural plane, as India emerges as an important country in Asia, maybe an important country across the world, and the West starts courting India in many ways. I'm, I'm using the word very carefully. And if India is seen to be the recipient of all what the West has to offer in terms of technology and other matters, the conflict between China and India will intensify to a far greater degree. India has no ambitions on, on anything that the Chinese have. But it's essentially a concept of influence. 
The Chinese regard themselves as the only civilized nation in the world. I don't want to talk about what they say about the West, but, but this, and I think they consider the Indians also to be inferior. So there'll always be a conflict between the two countries. What we need to do is to ensure, and what India tries to do, is to ensure that there's no major conflict. We believe that we can, we can deal with all the issues that are pa paramount today without entering into a, a conflict. That's why we are not part of any major alliance. Because the situation in the Indo-Pacific has become a little tense, we have, in a sense, aligned ourselves with the, with the Quad. Did, does not believe it as to be a defense alliance, but it's in, in, invariably or inevitably been drawn into that kind of situation. But we are hopeful that there will never be a conflict in which we have to take sides in, 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 and engage in a war with the China. So the basic point is to understand the nature of the India-China conflict. It's very different from for ter territorial aggrandizement or this and that. We have no problems with the rest of Asia. I mean, with, I heard the, uh, the gentleman from Indonesia. I mean, Indonesia and India have a common culture of every kind, I mean, including religious culture. So, I, uh, so I, the point I'm trying to stress is, do not see the Sino-Indian conflict as one for territorial aggrandizement or conflict. It's, it's a which particular system of philosophy will prevail. I rest my case uh, because Jerry has been sort of... Yes, because unfortunately yeah, yeah, there is I only know. one minute left. Yeah. So please, unfortunately, there will be no second round and we have a very, very busy schedule, uh, especially this afternoon. So, uh, okay. please, v very short remark. Okay. Okay. Takita. Yeah. So, uh, two, com two points uh, about the concept of Indo Pacific. Uh, I, I said uh, there is a portrait and impressionist and pointillism approach. These are not uh, mutually exclusive. So, countries who don't want to antagonize China will ad can adopt interest sharing approach. And those countries who want to shape that order, like Japan, maybe adopt no sharing normal approach. But maybe the US wants to expand the democracy, so adopt a share, sharing value approach. So these will go simultaneously. Everybody paint pointillism picture, impressionist picture, portrait picture at the same time, and this combined together will be uh, in the Pacific order. And also, uh, sorry, the purpose, purpose uh, for us is not to choose. But in order not to choose, we have to avoid the war. And in order to have to avoid the war, we have to fix the balance of power in the region uh, that has shifted to too favorable to China, militarily, economically. So in order to coexist with China without being have to choose, maybe we need to push back a little bit more militarily, politically, so that we can coexist with China. Thank you. Thank you very much. Douglas? Just very quickly, in contrast with this morning's dis discussion of how Europe has uh, so successfully united in its reaction to the invasion of Ukraine, I think conflict of that nature in the Asia-Pacific region will not produce similar unified responses. It will be very much situationally de uh, determined. It will be coalitions of the willing of, of different sizes, depending on the sense of what the threat is to their particular interests. But we're not going to see the kinds of, of uh, unified coalition response in the Asia-Pacific region or Indo-Pacific region that you would in Europe. Superior so, civilizations, so, Doug. Yes, <laughs> yes well, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have to uh, align ourselves uh, with the United States uh, leadership uh, to make uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, very uh, free and peaceful and prosperous I mean, uh, region. So it means that uh, we have to invest. So, and uh, uh, one other late comers to this IPS is Canada. Canada recently uh, announced its uh, participation uh, and uh, in, uh, they you know, laid out in the Pacific strategy to support long-time growth prosperity and security, beginning with an investment of almost $2.3 billion over the next five years. I think that this is the way we can 
mitigate the contradiction uh, Doug uh, explained between security and economy, which uh, we should uh, choose. So pouring money to make the region prosperous, then uh, in the Pacific, uh, Pacific uh, strategy will succeed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. As for all panels, it is a bit frustrating because we would like to continue. Just one word to conclude. This illustrates that the world today, the current situation of the world, is much more complex than we are used to talk about, and that it is much more full of uncertainties, including, I insist, on Europe, because uh, the purpose of the first session was to discuss the post-war uh, post uh, Europe, and uh, as you could see, it was very difficult to have the speaker speak really uh, 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 of that issue, the post-war uh, Europe. So uh, let us uh, try to remain clear-minded. Thank you very much indeed, and now we switch to the next uh, panel.